Lord God, we thank you for another day, life, health, and strength. You are so wonderful and awesome. Thank you, Lord God, for our gift of life. Lord Father, we thank you for allowing us, Lord Father God, to wake up in our right mind, having the use of our limbs, breath in our body, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Father, for allowing us to have a mind that is set toward you, that is set on you, that is about you, Lord God, that is for you. Hallelujah, Jesus. And Lord Father, we thank you. Today we praise you, Lord God. With all our being, we praise you, Lord God. With our thoughts, we praise you. With our speech, Lord God, we praise you. With all that we do. And Father, thank you for the message that is coming forth, Lord God. Thank you for the food, the word of God, the living word, Lord Father, that teaches us, builds us, grows us, strengthens us. Nourish us, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord Father, for allowing us to be able to obtain the knowledge, but also the understanding and the wisdom for application, Lord God, for our daily lives, the practical application, God. Lord Father, allow us, Lord God, to be able to retain it, to remember, Lord God, let it be written on the tablets of our heart. Lord God, let it be ingrained in us. Lord Father, let it become a part of our DNA, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And Father, strengthen the woman of God. Bless her continuously. And Lord Father, protect her from every side, from all things, Lord God, that come to hinder, to distract, to destroy, to dismay, to confound, Lord God, to keep her from being able, Lord God, to do your work. Lord Father, you protect her. You keep her, Lord God. Also, her husband, do the same. This ministry, do the same. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, very intercessor that is on this line that will be calling in, that will be listening to the recording. Lord Father, we thank you for them. Thank you for their strength. Thank you, Lord God, for their growth. Thank you, Lord Father, for their maturity in you. And Lord Father, continue to keep them. And we say thank you, Lord God, for our assignments on today. We thank you. We glorify you. We honor you, Lord God, and whatever the need is that we have, Lord Father, as we attend to your business, as we tend to what you have signed us to do today, Lord God, attend to us in our situation, our circumstance. And Lord Father, it will be all good, for you are good. And we give you the glory and honor, the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Marlies. I greatly appreciate that awesome prayer. Good morning, intercessors. You know, we've been studying about the Word, and I'm not sure about the rest of you, but God has been putting it to the test already. How many of you had someone yesterday that you had to talk to about the Word, about the power of the Word, about guarding their ear gates and eye gates so that what's in their heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, what's in their heart will come out and it'll sound more like Christ. Amen? I know for me, I end up having at least 20 conversations yesterday with different people, and it all had to do with what they were speaking about, the words. Whether it was having idle words come out of their mouths, or whether it was talking to them about not allowing people to upset them, reminding them that life is only 10% of what happens to you, but 90% of how you respond, whether it was talking about the strength and the magnitude and the power of the words that we speak because we are made in God's image and he spoke this word into existence. So whatever the conversation was, it always came back to words. Perhaps I wasn't the only one. Amen? But if you had time to meditate on the scriptures yesterday, God was speaking to us. Amen? We're studying about the word, the logos, the written word of God. 
And that, and we talked about yesterday how God has always revealed himself in some way or another, right? But the incarnation that is the clearest and most compelling revelation of who God is, his holiness, his love, and his power, was the word. Because Jesus is one with the Father, and he is uniquely able to communicate the Father's heart, right, and his mind as the logos, the word. Everything about Jesus, his teachings, his miracles, his suffering, his death, even his resurrection, speaks to us of God and his master plan. Amen? You see, our destiny depends on how well we listen. Will we believe or will we turn a deaf ear to the message of God's love? So when we pray to Jesus as the word, the logos, we're praying to the one whose voice calls us from death to life, just as he did Lazarus, or calls us from darkness into the light, his light. Amen? So our focus scripture all week long is going to be John 1, verse 1 through 14. But today I want us to go to John 1, and we're going to read verse, <laughs> verse 1. In the beginning, the Word was, I'm sorry, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. I'm getting some feedback, someone from the line I apologize. Amen. Let's start over. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Though through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. Let's stop there, verse 4. I want you all to meditate on those verses, John 1, verse 1 through 4. Amen? And you can even go as far back as Genesis 1. Amen? Genesis 1, verse 1 through 5. But I want us today, as we're meditating on those two sets of verses, I want us to praise God this morning for his all-powerful word. I want us to offer thanks for Christ's words to us, to each and every one of us. Amen? I want us to go in our prayer closets this morning and confess any lack of faith in the Word of God. Because Scripture tells us, and it has been proven, that God's Word will not return unto him void. It will accomplish everything that he sent it out to do. Right? Well, his Word tells us confirms in us and through us and about us that this world and everything made in it will pass away, but his word will remain. So you can take stock in the word. You can have faith in it. You can believe on it, hope on it. And I want us today to ask God to increase our love for his scriptures. The Logos, the written word of God. Amen? Now, I told you all this story, but every time I tell it, I, I get tickled because um, I absolutely adore having conversations with my, my girlfriends because I, I have some strange friends. And I think these two are probably right up there at the top of the strange category. But I have a girlfriend, one of them. She is in love with numbers. She thinks of them as having distinct personality traits. She'll tell you a story and she'll say, for instance, take the number six. 
the compulsive talker six, she starts off always. She informs everyone about this number six. Number six always dominates the weak-minded seven. Who does whatever six tells him to do? Now, the number eight, on the other hand, is a hard one to pin down. He's the creative, playful type, always chuckling over some private joke that he has. And so her description of the antics and the personalities and various relationships among numbers is fascinating. It still fascinates me because, believe it or not, I, like a lot of people, am mathematically challenged when you start adding numbers and letters. Amen? So uh, for me, I just don't have that love for numbers the way she does. However, I have another girlfriend. And she is like me. We absolutely love words. And so she takes it to a whole nother level, but I still love her all the same. She says that words um, have living colors. For instance, she sees the word open as white with a green tinge to it. Can is a seafoam green, and the word no is a deep purplish blue. Clearly, both of my friends are just a little bit weird, but you have to love the creativity in them. And their differences fascinate every person that will sit and listen. And so wouldn't you know it that my first girlfriend grew up to be a statistician. She loves numbers. And my second girlfriend, she grew up to be a writer. She loves words. So just as much as I love words, I also know that human words, in addition to being beautiful, can also be deceptive, treacherous and empty, right? How many of us have experienced that? You know, we can talk a blue streak without saying a single word. By contrast, God's word, however, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, Hebrews 4 and 12. You see, God's word is and has the power not just to communicate his purpose, but to accomplish whatever he intends. It never returns to him empty, a void, as scripture says. Amen? So when God speaks, things happen. Take. Hey, the first page of Genesis. Remember we talked about that a while back. For the first three days, God spoke and he formed the world. Amen? And then the next three days, he spoke and he filled the world. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And light has been reproducing itself at the speed of light from that time, even till today. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And today, we still have water and dry ground, right? And God said, let the land produce vegetation. And it was. And vegetation has been reproducing and even creating new vegetation with man's help. Amen? Since that time forward. So the world was created by God speaking it into existence. Jesus, 
the Word of God, the Logos, the second person in the Trinity, was thus present at the world's beginning. But the perfect world that God created was so corrupted through sin. Right? And Jesus came to earth to recreate the world, restoring it to God's original purpose. Miracles happened when he spoke. Storms ceased. The lame walked. People were delivered from demons, and the dead was raised. These were signs that a world deformed by sin was being reshaped by God's all-powerful word. So listen to the record of the gospel. Jesus said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. King James Version says, peace, be still. Amen. Then Jesus said to the paralytic, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And the man got up, took up his mat and went home. Jesus rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out of the grave. You see, Jesus is still speaking, still reshaping the world, one person at a time now. So as his disciples, as his followers, and as his fans, and for those of you who are in Bible study with us or in SWAT training with us, Pastor Trey has been teaching us that there are three levels of students of Christ, right? We have the fans. They're just you know, they, 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 they understand who Christ is, but they're just not quite sure they're ready to sell out for it. They're convinced of who he is. Now, the followers, the second group, they're convicted. Their hearts have been touched. They've seen some miracles. They've experienced some fantastic things. But they still have some areas in their lives that they're not willing to let go of, some things that they do that won't please God, that, that won't allow them to truly enter into the presence of God because they don't want to let them go. But they're convicted. Amen. And then we have those disciples those disciplined students, they're converted. And they're changing. They're the new creation that Scripture talks about. Amen. And so we all need to study and pray over his words. We need to listen carefully and expectantly for his voice. I challenge you all to try spending 10 or 15 minutes today meditating on John 1, verse 1 through 4, and then spend another 10 or 15 minutes meditating on Genesis 1, 1 through 5. Now, if you've ever been in a study with Pastor Trey about Genesis, and I promise you it took us, I want to say, two and a half, almost three months just to get through to Genesis 4. Genesis is a powerful book, and if you learn how to truly dig into, read, and research the Word of God, it's not just a simple calling out of the words. But if you meditate on it and ask the Holy Spirit to give you clarity, give you understanding, open your heart and mind to receive what he's about to reveal to you, today, then Ask the Spirit of God to 
nourish your mind and your heart as you listen for the voice of the Lord to speak to you, to speak life into you. Amen? And as I was praying and meditating this morning, still talking about those words, right? The Lord had me to minister to um, a young lady yesterday. And in me talking to her, the Lord had me to let her know that because she loves Christ and she believes in him, that she's not just a cleaned up version of her old self. Did you catch that? You're not just a cleaned up version of your old self. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. You see, most Christians or Christians see ourselves as a cleaned up version of our old self rather than a brand new creation who did not exist before. But the Bible tells us, just as in, I just read in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. The old is gone, not just spiffed up, polished up, cleaned up, but gone, dead and buried. And some of us need to leave that carcass buried. And not keep trying to dredge it up every time an incident or something happens, right? Oh, the old me would have, oh, if you had met me before. Oh, if you had known me before salvation or before deliverance, before Christ. You wouldn't be talking to me that way. But that's the old you. We don't glory in the old us. We glory in Christ. So I have a girlfriend who, after high school, she went to college for only a few semesters. And while she was there, she met a Christian man who uh, was at her friend's Bible study. She saw him sitting on the floor with his back against the wall, with his red shirt on, rolled up, showing his muscular arms. And it was something about this man with this worn Bible in his lap and an easy smile on his face. And wouldn't you know, before the year was up, she had become his wife. About four years later, she became a mom. And life was good, except for that termite-like gnawing that she used to always talk about to me. It was in her gut, you know, that when you get some, from time to time that tries to tell you you're just not quite measuring up to all the other church moms or the football moms or the soccer moms. You're not doing enough. You're not good enough, there's always going to be something that's going to be exposed from your past and people won't appreciate you or understand you or like you anymore. They won't respect you. They don't really know who you really are. Right? And she will walk around in fear that one day she'd be found out. That one day folks will figure out that she wasn't all that they thought she was cracked up to be. She went to Bible studies. She even taught a few of them. And she lived under this undefined, self-imposed standard of approval that always said she wasn't good enough. And so, you know those childhood echoes that try to haunt us as adults. You're so ugly. You're so fat. You're kind of crazy. What's wrong with you? You did a terrible job. 
you know those negative things that come flying out. And they always kind of leave us feeling congenitally flawed, right? And so hmm, she would sit in Bible study groups like someone is um, sitting in a waiting room, hoping for the best but expecting the worst. You know, her greatest fear was that she'd be no longer or no closer to being free of those insecurities than she was when she first arrived at the Bible study. She'd enter in the church one way, and unfortunately, she would leave the same way. And it took her to get to her mid-30s. And she sat on the very long young lady, or what would you say? She sat on the church mother named Mary Marshall Young. And she opened her eyes to the truth in Scripture about who she was and what she had and where she was, her position, you know, as a child of God. How many of us struggle with those? And it was amazing because at the same time she was going through that, I was a little younger, but I was going through some of the same things. And we would have long conversations about it. And as Mother Young began to pour into her, she had her to read those verses scattered throughout the scriptures uh, before, you know, you know, the ones that tell us who we are in God and who he's called us to be, his promises. But when my girlfriend was encouraged to cluster them together, Put them into one list. God began a new work in our heart. And as she shared with me, he began to work in my heart. You are a saint. You are chosen and dearly loved. You are wonderfully and beautifully made. You are holy. You are the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. You see, these truths are right there in the pages of the Bible, right there in black and white and a few of them in red, right? We knew it. We knew that it was the infallible word of God. But we felt rather squeamish hearing that word and reading them and then believing them about ourselves. How many of you are in that category or have written in that boat down those lonely waters? They don't feel right. They didn't sound right coming out of our mouths. They made us downright uncomfortable sometimes until Mother Young began to explain some things. That before we came into Christ, we were trained wrong. We were trained by a sin-sick fallen world a world that seeks to promote the enemy's agenda, not God's. And that's to steal, kill, and destroy. And some people want to say that it's a physical thing. But why can't he just steal your motivation, your passion, your vision, your dreams? Why can't he destroy your destiny and your future, destroy your hope, your passion? Why can't he kill your desire to truly believe that you are who God says you are? Either way, he'll accomplish his job, right, if you allow him to win. You see, it doesn't have to be a physical death. He doesn't have to physically steal something that you can touch, taste, and feel and smell away from you. He can literally just make you doubt who you really are, 
who God created you to be. Doubt the purpose for why you're here. Doubt that you are truly the child of God. Doubt that you're truly forgiven. Doubt that you're capable of accomplishing what God has created you for. Doubt that you're good enough. Doubt that you're loved. That you're smart enough. And in doing so, he's already won. Right? So at the same time that we were studying about our true identity, the devil began to taunt us again with those lies. Who do you think you are? A saint? Are you kidding? This stuff might be true for some people, but it's certainly not true about you. How many of you heard that statement? A time of three from the enemy. But the truth of the matter is this. He wouldn't be hitting you with those comments so hard if he wasn't trying to convince you of it. Better yet, try this one. If what he was saying was actually true, he wouldn't have to keep repeating it. He'd only have to say it one time. But the fact that he keeps echoing it, and for decades you've heard it, there's no way that it could be true. So I challenge you all, when you hear those comments, Use the word of God. I am a saint. I am the child of God. I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Repeat what the word says. Like I told you a long time ago, you can reject and send back to the sender everything that the enemy tries to send at you. That includes his negative words his little suggestions that he tries to whisper in your ear. It only takes a second for you to listen and then send it back to the sender. Reject it, rebuke it, and send it back. And bind it to the sender. But at the end, you'll be free. Amen? Because after I had listened to that for a couple of decades, going into three decades, God asked me one day a very important question, one that he's asking you right now. Who are you going to believe? That's what I'm asking you today. Who are you going to believe? When I decided to believe God, that changed everything in my life. I believe it will do the same for you if you will only believe what God says about you because it's true. Remember the power of words. So do you have echoes of your past that taunt you? Lies from the enemy that tease you. Then here's how you handle that situation. Here's the way to change what the way you think. When you hear it, recognize that it's a lie. Reject the lie. Rebuke it, send it back to the sender, and replace it with the truth of God's word. Now, the challenge to that is this. It's not so hard to recognize the lie because it's the same ones you've been hearing and that's been rehearsed in your mind so many times over and over. It's not hard to reject the lie because you're saying it with your mouth. I reject that. I reject that thought. My mind is the mind of Christ. I rebuke that thought that was negative, and I send it back to the sender. That part's not the hard part. 
The hard part is this. Do you know the word of God so that you can tell yourself the truth out of the word of God? Because the truth of God will stand up to and defend itself against any lie. So think of one lie that you believe about yourself. And then I challenge you to find a verse in God's word that tells you what God says about you, how God sees you, to replace that lie. And every time the enemy whispers that lie to you, you recognize the lie, reject the lie. Rebuke the lie, send it back to the sender, and replace it with the truth. Now, like I told you my story, I had to do it out loud until I was strong enough in my spirit man to do it silently within me. So even in conversations, I will say, excuse me one second, turn to the side and say, I reject that lie in the name of Jesus. I reject that thought in the name of Jesus. I send it back to the sender. I rebuke it and I bind it there to the sender. My mind is the mind of Christ. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. I am a child of God. I am the beloved of God. I am the apple of his eye. I'm his daughter. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ to the throne. I am victorious through Christ Jesus. And if that doesn't give you power, if that doesn't give you courage and strength, I don't know what will. But the word of God is truth. Amen? So meditate on that. Think about your challenge while I close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, this morning. We thank you for meeting us right here, Lord God, where we are. Lord, we thank you for choosing each and every one of us. Help us to believe that we are who you say we are, even when we don't feel like it. We are standing on the truth of your word. Some with shaky legs, others rooted and grounded. But, Lord, we're standing all the same. We're trusting in your word today, your logos, and Jesus Christ himself. Help us to be better disciples, disciplined students, not just fans or followers. We don't want to be just convinced, Lord God. We don't want to be convicted. We want to be converted, Heavenly Father, changed from inside out created, reshaped, and made new. Help us to listen carefully and expectantly for your voice. Help us to meditate on your word today. That your spirit may nourish our hearts and our minds as we listen for your voice to give us instruction to give us strength, to speak life into us that will sustain us for today's journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns? Did God bless you? Did he encourage you? Did he speak to your heart? Did he minister to where you are today? Did he remind you of some things? Intercessors, this is our time to share.